Hi, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to you know, present here at the ACI convention in spring and in San Francisco. Uh, my name is uh, Chekuk Na. I'm the resource associate at Rutgers University. And uh, I have t another uh, four colleagues who work with together, uh, who is uh, Thales and the postdoc and two PhD student, Chen and Serap, and uh, my uh, supervisor, Hany Nassif. And I talk about the, you know, the topic about the uh, uh, lessons learned of data fusion of uh, different components of the structures monitoring the uh, uh, digital twins, or you can call it as a finite element modeling, and also the way in motion uh, to evaluate the structure. So first of all, I want to introduce our center that we are currently working with. Uh, this is a called Situ Smart uh, University Transportation Center, and the NIU is leading the, leading the team, and Rutgers and the uh, University of Washington, UTEP, and City College of New York are working together. And this center focuses on the smart cities and the connected vehicles and uh, autonomous vehicle and also uh, resilient, resilience of the structure. And our team at Rutgers are focusing on the, uh, the uh, structure resilience side. Uh, this is the overview of our project. Uh, uh, because of the, the work that we are still working with the agency, we cannot tell what exactly this project is about. But we just talk about how we have been using uh, uh, different data to fusion to understand the, uh, the structure more um, in in a in better way. So talk about the bridge itself, and then talk about the the, the sensor uh, sensor type that we have used. And then uh, about the talk about structure monitoring, and then digital twin or final element modeling, and wave motion and lessons learned. Uh, so this bridge is is in in New York City, and this was built in 1944. And this is very unique structure, and this is a picture from 1944. Uh, in the past, this is uh, available online. And those bridge, this bridge has a triple uh, triple cantilever structure that is nowhere to see, like this structure. And this is one of the heaviest traffic uh, corridor in New York City. And the, the uh, ADT is about, every daily traffic is about 150,000 vehicles a day. And over 25,000 trucks are passing this corridor. And the up to like more than 1,000 vehicle every hour, I mean, every trucks are passing this corridor. And the problem of this bridge is it has been long. It has, it has been more than 70 years. There are, uh, there has been a couple of, uh, rehabilitation, uh, 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 activity happened, but still some of the, but they still have some problem right now and they want to understand what's, what is the problem and, and, and so that we can help them to, uh, for the future rehabilitation of the bridge. So this is overview of our whole work. You know, we try to combine all those structures, mo structures monitoring and digital twin or finite modeling and the wave motion data together in order to obtain what is the actual load applied to the bridge by the wave motion sensor and what is the uh, structural response uh, by this, the, uh, all the sensor technologies and also, and then using those information, how we can predict the uh, service life of the structure uh, for future. And, um, you know, all the speakers in the, before me, they all talk about these uh, sensors with the wire. And we have been using those wire sensors for a long time. And we have one of the projects in, in New Jersey that the bridge, on, uh, you see on the right bottom side, the bridge has, has some uh, sagging issue. It was hit by truck in the past and some sagging and also some torsional, uh, uh, torsional behavior. So uh, because of that, we have installed some sensors there, and we have been collecting data and, and uh, report to the DOT. But the, the, the problem is that the, the other other speaker have installed all those sensors when they are building, so it's easy to handle all those cable stuff. But in reality, what we are doing here is the bridge that is already built, and we want to install some sensors. And that's why we debated between wire sensor and wireless sensor and what we have to use between them. And because of the cabling issue and another problem of this bridge, as, is, as, I, as I told you, the bridge is, very, is heavily used and they allow to close between 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. only during the weekdays. And if you think about the, uh, the uh, uh, MPT procedure, it takes about an hour in each time back and forth. So we have about two, three hours every night that we can work on. So the wire is kind of messy for us to work with. So we ended up using, choosing the wireless sensors. Uh, so first, uh, first thing first, we, I'll talk about the structure and small thing that we have installed there. So we have used the accelerometers and tiltmeters and string transducers. 
Uh, we didn't use that uh, typical geocon strain, uh, strain fiber and wire gauges because this is not that we can do something uh, using that sensors. But we have used those uh, three type of sensors installed along the spans, you know, at the joint and also along the, the mid spans to compare how they behave uh, behave differently between spans and also between joint and the mid, uh, mid span. And uh, the system consists with the uh, data logger having the um, the solar panel and battery and the solar panel charging controller and also the LTE modem. So then we have uh, the uh, remote uh, remote connection to the sensor and to the system so we can download data anytime needed. Two things I want to mention about this wireless sensor is one is about the range of uh, for communication. Uh, based on the cost rate, it they said it can come you can communicate more than a mile. But in reality, you know, because of all those uh obstructs, like some uh some uh some walls and some barriers and, and some steel members of the structure, the actual range of the communication is about 150 or 240 at most. And so uh because of that, we had to design well in order to have good connection with all the sensors. And we have about nine, well, nine span over there, and we have to position well of those, uh, the uh, data logger to communicate all those sensors. Another problem is the uh, battery that we realized. It can last a few weeks to up to like a couple of months, depending on how often you collect the data or how long you collect data every time. So we have some um, the uh, primary data collection before implementing this for about a couple of months, long, a bit long, uh, long term monitoring. We try to see what is the threshold that we need to decide in order to uh, obtain good data from all those spans. And that th we got about 0.2 G is the, is the is target, uh, the strain, uh, the, uh, acceleration level that we collect from, from those, all those acceleration, uh, accelerate, uh, accelerometers. And the other data were also measured only for, not for long term, but for the, uh, to calibrate the uh, FE modeling and other, and other uh, testings. So um, how we use those exploration data is, you know, we want to see what, how we can correlate between what we observe in the field and how, what you are measuring from this exploration data. And we, the bridge was, again, is not in good condition. So we check how the deck condition looked like Although it's not the actual deck condition because the deck is covered with the asphalt, you know, with very thick asphalt. But the, from the, uh, from the bottom side, the surface side, you were able to easily to identify what, how the, the joint or deck look like. So based on those field observations, we try to, um, uh, identify which side is good condition, which side is bad condition from the, from good, uh, from good to, uh, poor. And then, at the same time, based on this, uh, the acceleration threshold that we set earlier, what is the average of the maximum, uh, ma uh, average maximum, uh, acceleration along this corridor? And that we, we noticed that in general, the acceleration, the, the, um, the, uh, how much of the ex uh, acceleration is observed is correlated to the, uh, deck, deck condition, either top of the deck or bottom of the deck. But in some, in, in some cases, we don't see that a good collation, and that's probably because the text, <clears throat> there are some more, uh, declaration that is not being seen from, from outside, which some, some things happen inside, we cannot, but we cannot see that, uh, from outside. And other sensor we have used is fiber optic sensor. Uh, the previous sensors are wireless sensors with a, a battery power, but these fiber optic sensors cannot be operated using battery. So this is powered, um, and uh, the first thing we have used earlier was the high resolution fiber optic sensor, and this really provides good results, as you see in the <coughs> results here. We were able to ident identify how the, the correct location and how much correct the correct width we we were able to identify them. But the problem of this sensor is not is not strong enough to implement in the field. So we work with the other, uh, other, uh, this, uh, called SMS. We call with them that they have a, a rugged fire optic sensor that you can install on the actual bridge and that, that can last long. The problem, the problem of this one is it cannot measure every inches. It can measure only, it can, it will average the strain every four inches. 
So we can measure the strain every four inches along the uh, corridor, but this can measure a very long, uh, long distance. Uh, compared to other point sensor, it can measure only one point. Uh, for this job, we, we, you know, we work with the contractor, dig out the, uh, the asphalt and, and then bear out the concrete deck and clean, dry, and then groove and epoxy and install the sensors. After that, we cover with the uh, steel uh, U-shaped tube on top so that we, it does not load it by the traffic on the bridge. So it, it can purely measure the bending uh, uh, by the truck. However, one thing that I want to mention about this sensor is very rough and it's good for the field application. But the problem is that this structure is very rigid. And what you measure, I'll tell uh, next slides, is that the, the, the strain, the maximum strain that we measure along the structure with the 80,000 pound of truck is only eight, uh, eight micro strain or 10 micro strain. It's very small. It's very rigid. But the noise level of this sensor is about 10 to 15 micro strain. So we thought this is a very good application for, uh, for our case. But eventually, I mean, at the end, this didn't help for us for this uh, short term. But however, we wanted to uh, validate how this sensor worked. So we had some beams tested in the lab. They were uh, T-shaped and also uh, rectangular shape. We installed the four, four gauge uh, inside of the um, the beam uh, along the uh, the river, and also we installed the fiber optic sensors inside and outside. So we saw that we want to validate how these fiber optic sensor behave uh, along with the uh, four strand gauges. So. Um, before, so we, 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 uh, we also had the, uh, the, uh, the ability to measure the, uh, deflection at the same time. So we were able to measure the load, uh, load deflection curve. And before cracking, they, the four strand gauge and the fiber optic sensor really match as well. So they are very close. But after cracking, we saw some separation between the, the blue and red and, uh, green. Uh, I am yellow and green because of some, uh, some debonding between the, the fiber optic sensor and the, the concrete. And after yielding, it's totally separated because the, uh, the epoxy is, is normally uh, uh, totally debonded from the concrete. So that's why we have a lot of changes here. But, um, but overall, what we noticed that is this for, for the, the distributed fiber optic sensor can provide good, uh, good strain results when it has much higher strain. So we, we, uh, we are recommending to, to, uh, to agency that this has to be used for long term in order to capture some, you know, big event happening to the bridge. And this, this one, uh, this sensor was applied to other bridges in, in the U.S. and for the long span bridges. And they were able to identify the exact correct location when it happened. So, but, uh, unfortunately, we were able to identify something from the lab results. From the field, we, we couldn't get any, um, any uh, good results. The second thing is about digital twin, or again, the fine element modeling. So we, with the target span was modeled using the, uh, the, uh, abacus. And we used that, um, model and used the, the two trucks, class nine and class seven trucks to calibrate the model using the data that we are collecting from the field. So two data we have used to, uh, to update the model. We use the, um, strain data and also, uh, acceleration data. So for both cases, we tested in a static test, also, also, uh, dynamic test. And we were able to use those information to update our model. At the same time, um, there were some cores that the uh, agency did in the past and they have, and they got some, uh, also we tested the, uh, concrete properties, strengths, modulus, and Poisson ratio, and also the, the, uh, section rows based on the, uh, rebar corrosion. And those information also, uh, included in the FE modeling to update, uh, the FE modeling. And last piece of my presentation is about the, uh, wave motion. So the wave motion sensor is good to provide what is the load applied to the structure, uh, as of now. So there are a couple of type of different wave motion sensors, which is uh, the PVDF sensor, quartz, both are piezoelectric type, and bending plates and uh, low cell. Among those, we installed the PVDF sensors and quartz sensor to obtain the uh, live load spectra of the bridge, as well as to compare how they how they compare uh, in terms of accuracy. 
So um, as you see on the right side, this is the, the plus from the Class 9 truck, the uh, 3S2 or uh, semi-trailer trucks. And the, uh, the core sensor has been shown good results. I'll show other uh, slides next one to show how, uh, I mean, the, uh, the accuracy of the sensor. But assuming the core sensor is, is accurate, the PV depth sensors uh, overestimate when the load is light, and sometimes it also underestimates when the load is heavy. So overall, normally you have to see uh, two peaks. When is the, uh, for a class nine truck, when it's empty, it's about 30 kips, and it's full, it's about 80 kips. But you see the, the blue one, the PV depth sensors don't see that trend, and that's why, uh, that's why we uh, have concluded from this study. The last bit, I mean, for this wind sensors, you know, we have to calibrate this. So we use five different trucks uh, along the corridor, which is two class nine truck, one class six, and two class five trucks. And those are, the selection of those trucks is based on three standards, which is ASTM uh, E1318 and the international standard YML R134-1 and COST, the European code, COST 323. And using those all, uh, different type of trucks, we try to calibrate the sensors, and we are able to meet the uh, the uh, accuracy level per ASTM standard, which is about 6% of gross, gross weight, 100% uh, uh, compliance, which means all the ones that we, we had, the, the core sensor provide good results, while the uh, P, uh, PBDF sensors is 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 hard to comply with uh, type 1 or even type 2, which is 10 or 15% of gross weak weight error. Uh, when we do the same, using the same drug when you calibrate them. So, the, 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 for the fusion between WIM and SHIM is important because you, you have to know what is, what is load and what is the, uh, what is load side and also what is the, uh, resistance side. So, uh, we try to capture the truck at the, the, uh, the structural monitoring site to see what are the trucks and how they, and what are the, uh, the, Results, uh, what are the strain level and acceleration because of those trucks? And then we got the, the weight motion, which is a truck weight and the, the excess spacing, those information from the weight motion uh, system. So, you know, I ever can think that the strain is very well correlated with the load. You know, heavy load will have heavier, uh, higher strain and lighter load with a uh, small strain. And, but the correlation is not very, really, very straightforward. There are some uh, variance. That's because there are, the bridge is open to traffic and there are two-way traffic up and down. So there are other factors that could affect, but overall the strain is well collected with the, the load. Uh, however, the, uh, the acceleration, we, we thought that the weight is very important, that it will be, play a big role on the acceleration of the uh, vibration of the bridge. However, um, you know, there are, when we notice that there are a couple of you know, color code, the blue one is light, and then gray and yellow one is heavy. The weight, the weight doesn't affect, uh, weight does not play any role on the acceleration, but the speed is very important. So whenever the speed is high, there's some interaction uh, between the vehicle suspension and the bridge that induce more acceleration, and that's why we have you know uh, this collision here. So that's all for the, uh, the fusion of all three components. So lesson learned is that wireless sensor, we need to worry about communication range, uh, you know, different from wire sensor, and also battery and power consumption in order to have a, a, a long-term monitoring. And the uh, rug, the uh, fiber optic sensor is good, but we, we have to worry about the, the noise level, but it could be good for the uh, long-term monitoring. And the core sensor of the, uh, the wind wave motion, it provides very high accurate data for live load spectra. And then between fusion of shim and uh, FEM, as everybody else has been doing so far, is we can calibrate the model to use that for the, uh, to future risk, to pre predict the future response and at the same time remaining service life. And the last piece is the shim and wind. The fusion of those things is very important so that we know what is the load there and what is uh, what would be the uh, consequences of that uh, uh, because of the load. So this is my end of presentation. I'd like to acknowledge to the support from DOT and the, the joint venture of this bridge and also see the Smart Our Center and Kistler and uh, SMS. Uh, 
uh, consulting company for their effort and for their uh, for their financial support. Thank you.